onomatopoeia. The formation or use of words that imitate the sounds associated with the object or actions they refer to. The property of a word of sounding like what it represents. Water has many. The interdependent relationship between water and sound is so fundamental to our connection and understanding of water. The rain patters and drums, the waves roar, the brook murmurs and whispers, the puddles of mud squelch, that it is intrinsically woven into the very linguistic code of our language. Many have explored the powerful connection between sound and water. We have Masuro Emoto and his study exploring the impact of sound on the molecular structure of water. We have those that like to play around with cymatics. There is Peter Davy, a saxophone player who invented a device that boils water with sonic waves. The innovative use of sound coupled with water seems to have no end. So much so that in recent times, biologists are discovering that ultrasonic water can even treat the most resistant of infections and heal wounds at rapid pace. And in a future where electromagnetism was harnessed with the utmost innovation, water, sound and frequency had to have a major role to play. And of course it did. They wanted us to know that it did. And not just the water here on Earth. They were telling us to look up and above. They wanted us to know that what they had achieved right here on Earth was only possible because they had studied what existed above. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Some criticized the King James translation of the Bible for its use of the word firmament. But in the original Hebrew, the word is rakia, which translates directly as firmament. In the New International Version, it is called the vault. In the English Standard Version, it is an expanse. In the Good News Translation, it is dome. What is important, however, is that in all translations, and in the original Hebrew, the notion of the firmament, or vault, separating the waters above from the waters below, does not change and remains consistent. There is water above our realm. The telescope is an interesting instrument, both at once an apparatus for discovery and simultaneously a weapon of deceit. There are two primary types of telescope, the refractor and the reflector. A refractor uses an objective lens, usually a convex lens, and a reflector utilizes a single or a combination of curved mirrors to reflect light and form an image. Many reflector telescopes use either a concave mirror or a parabolic mirror. This is what a reflection looks like in these mirrors. The eyes we were born with and which we see the world through are convex lenses. We do not witness the world through curved mirror reflections. This is Jupiter as seen through a reflecting Newtonian telescope. And despite the slight spherical distortion caused by the reflective mirrors, this is still not what NASA has shown us. Your mind immediately sees a planet, because you have been programmed, since birth, to associate an image like this with the notion of a planet. Just in the same way you associate the moon with a ball of rock by default. But as you can see here, both refracting and reflecting telescopes produce images similar to the Nikon P900. The Nikon lenses have been criticized by some astronomers 
as lacking the power to really see the luminaries above. But as you can see here, there is not much difference between the Nikon and both types of telescope. And in each we see that Jupiter is radiating some kind of light of its own. Both amateur and professional astronomers present footage such as this. But look what happens next. The astronomers here are using imaging processing software to turn their raw images and footage which display a circular object in the sky above us radiating its own light into a NASA style planet. And this type of doctored, processed image is not what we see with our own eyes through these lenses. I am not saying that this is deliberate deception. Astronomy is a practice of its own. But it is very important to never confuse the highly edited images and footage we receive with reality. And it is also worth being mindful of those that are being very manipulative. They are usually the astronomers with the paid sponsorship from magazines and websites. It is also important to note that what we call planets are not actually planets. They are wandering stars, and all of the wandering stars are of a similar nature to the moon. Unlike the rest of the stars above our firmament, their course and journey above us is not fixed and consistent. Their paths deviate from the concentric paths that the rest of the stars consistently make around Polares. And the reason for this is because they are not located within the waters beyond the firmament. They are very different, and their function is way more occult, and their significance to life here on Earth much more important than we realize. We will be returning to the true nature of the so-called planets and moon later. Back to the waters. Arcturus is one of the brightest stars in the sky. Here is Science Magazine's artistic impression of the star. And now here is Arcturus as seen through a refracting telescope. There is no resemblance. What we see through this telescope footage is really similar to what we see when you zoom in on the stars above with a powerful Nikon camera. Many criticize the refracting telescope because it can produce chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is a failure of the lens to focus all color to the same point. The result can be purple fringing, and we see that here. Photographs can suffer from chromatic aberration. Interestingly, the Nikon does not produce the same chromatic aberration when zooming in on Arcturus. Therefore, you could say that the Nikon is actually more reliable and stable. Through both the telescopic lens and the Nikon, Arcturus is pulsing, shifting, rippling. It is dancing geometry. Many will jump up from their seats and exclaim, it's because of atmospheric distortion and light pollution. It's because Arcturus is so far away. But if it is atmospheric distortion, then why do all the stars display their own unique geometry and light patterns? They should all distort in a unified, consistent manner. It is not atmospheric distortion. The stars are pockets of sonoluminescence in the water above. They are self-illuminating, radiating their own light and frequencies in the waters above. Our own convex lensed eyes tell us that there is some kind of water above. We see it in the stars and when rockets accidentally hit the firmament. And, like I said before, just because the so-called planets or wandering stars and the moon appear spherical does not mean they are. They are not synonymous with the stars in the water beyond. They are something else entirely. Our advanced predecessors wanted us to watch the stars. They wanted us to understand that electromagnetic vibration and frequency produce pockets of sonoluminescence in the waters above. They were pointing it out because they wanted us to know that water was the key 
to unlocking the real potential of electromagnetic energy. They wanted us to know that once harnessed, the ethereal electromagnetic energy could be fused with water, so it could be stored and distributed. And once produced, the water could be manipulated, enhanced and elevated to a level of new possibilities through the use of vibration, frequency and sound itself. Their civilization depended on the industry of what we will call the living waters. Their technological advancement enabled them to transform the entire earth into a power grid. But this grid was only possible because of water. The civilization of the future was an electromagnetic water world. Canals are no great secret. They are found everywhere across our realm, both the great and the small. Most of the great canals around our earth are connected to the ocean. Salt water is an excellent conductor of electricity. Sodium chloride is ionized. We have the Corinth Canal, connected to the Aegean Sea. We have the Panama Canal that connects both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The Suez Canal connects with the Mediterranean Sea. And there is the Volga Don Canal, connecting the Azov Sea, Caspian Sea and Black Sea with the major oceanic networks. All of the canals built before the 1920s were not built by us or those in the history books. We inherited them. And while the official narrative tells us that the Volga Don was finished during the 1950s, its construction actually began back in the 16th century. All narratives surrounding the construction of these canals is purely fabricated. And I will show you how much later in our journey. Once you start paying attention, it becomes very evident that most continents and countries feature a combination of canals and rivers that span the entirety of the land itself. The citizens of the old world utilize the oceans and rivers to create a grid of interconnected waterways to provide water to all of their areas of habitation. In order to pass difficult sections and keep the supply going, they would build aqueducts and viaducts. Sometimes these were constructed with the purpose of energizing the water as it passed through and into different areas, and that is why many were designed with symmetrical archivolt structures. The Romans did not build these structures. The entire infrastructure of so many cities found across our realm are designed around canal systems. Look at Amsterdam from above. The precise geometric grid lines here are not roads. They are canals, and the sole purpose was to supply water from one area to another. The water was stored and manipulated for a variety of purposes in reservoirs, water towers, pumping stations, systems, and other structures. The water also functioned to provide necessary balance. A complex grid of electromagnetic production, distribution, and consumption would generate a lot of heat and magnetism. Water provided not only a balance of dire magnetism, but also ensured the entire grid did not overheat. When looking at all the magnificent generators and other instruments of power from the old world, we can always find water nearby or the remains of water storage. Sometimes this is hidden primarily underground. Many do not realize that many so-called Victorian cisterns and reservoirs run very far under a lot of our cities, and other times it is a central characteristic feature of these structures, an example of which is what the controllers have redesignated as castle moats. The electromagnetic water grid was not just an energized version of what we are already familiar with in our cities and towns. It was much, much, much more. It was way more magnificent, impressive, and futuristic than we could even imagine. The grid was connected to central, bigger power stations, or what is more appropriately termed star stations. Sometimes these were isolated stations, and other times they comprise entire cities. We are going to have to fly to a higher altitude for this. I need to show you. Hold on tight now and keep your eyes open. Look.
The sole existence, let alone construction, of these star structures is almost beyond our comprehension. As you saw, they are found everywhere across our realm, with undeviating geometric consistency. A wondrous impossibility. Perhaps they had some kind of technology that allowed them to view huge areas of land from above while planning and building. They were never forts. That is a fairy tale invented by our controllers. The stunning geometric precision and symmetry of the star structures would most likely have functioned to enhance the power of the generators and to etherize the water, or turn the water into living, energized water. We can see from comparing some of these ruined sites, and some left a little more intact, that water would have been present throughout the structure. Before the controllers destroyed and drained most of these structures, they were full of water. They were connected to rivers and canals and the oceans. They were a key component of the entire power grid. The star structures are fractals of symmetrical geometry, just like many of the ceilings of these huge energy generators. And, like the acoustic cavity magnetrons and resonators, the symmetrical sharp diagonal walls would have caused the ions to perpetually vibrate. Old plans and illustrations, which have no doubt been edited or manipulated in some way or another, offer a suggestion as to how complex, integrated and essential the star geometry was to the entire grid. Look at Paris here. It isn't obvious at first glance, but upon closer inspection, we come to realize that the entirety of Paris was itself a star station, or a star city. And like with everything else constructed in the old world, these structures were at once functional and a celebration of the source of their innovation. Look closer at the star geometry here. Can you see the resemblance? The snowflake. Do you remember what happened in Masuro Amoto's experiment on water? Ethereal vibration expressing itself through water's molecular structure. Those of the old world had perfected this science. They knew the key to releasing electromagnetism's potential was through sound and water. Just imagine what they were able to achieve. Sound, vibration and frequency was just as integral to the success of their technology as water was. Those of the old world did not hide their adoration for sound. Traces of this love for sound are everywhere. These structures were literally instruments of power. Or as the so-called Goethe put it so succinctly elsewhere, music is liquid architecture. Architecture is frozen music. This is why so many generators, capacitors, power stations and intermediates feature holes, pediments, dentils, indentations and complex 3D ornamentation. They were structural openings to manipulate sound waves, the vibrations and acoustics so they could tune the electromagnetic energy in conjunction with the water in a variety of ways to achieve different results. They were similar to the aerophone instruments such as the flute, the pipe, the recorder, the bassoon and the trumpet. The old world revered the geometry of the star because it was through the study of the stars in the waters above that they learned the power of fusing electromagnetism, vibration and frequency with water itself. They all work harmoniously and in concert with one another. This interconnected and interdependent energetic relationship is what makes the stars and all life itself possible in the first place. Look a little closer at the dancing geometry of the sonoluminescent stars beyond the firmament. Do they remind you of something else? That's right, all of the magnetrons, or what we've come to call rose windows, were designed to mirror the cymatic patterns of ether's vibrations in water itself. Artist Tanya Harris was onto something in 2013 when she turned her attention to studying and recording the silent resonant frequency of churches. By placing water inside of a loudspeaker, she was able to discover the hidden geometry of these resonant frequencies. The results showed that even the silence within these structures produced strong cymatic patterns. And again, can you see the resemblance? Others have applied the same technique and studied the cymatic patterns 
displayed when bells chimed within the structures. Look at the patterns. Magnetrons. This is why so many magnificent rose windows resemble cymatic patterns so closely. This is why they look like the petrified pulsations of a star. The entire ceilings of many cathedrals also mirror this sacred cymatic geometry. This is why so many of the structures contain huge bells and chiming clocks. The tolling bells would emit powerful vibrations and frequencies and influence an entire area's water supply. The sound would influence the molecular structure of the water, which was then used for a variety of purposes. And that's not all. Many of these structures also housed another wonder of the world. The king of sound. The organ. Have you ever stopped to look at some of the great organs before? These were not constructed by ordinary people in the 19th, 18th, 17th and 16th centuries. Like the structures they reside in, they are a marvel of elegance and majesty. The most powerful sound instrument in the world. The specific organ sound waves of low and high frequencies would no doubt have enabled those of the old world to manipulate the ethereal energy in ways they saw fit. The magnetron rose windows that would not have contained glass would amplify these sound waves, which in turn would influence the molecular structure and properties of the etherized living water. Organs would have had multiple uses, perhaps providing entire towns with specific resonant frequencies for good health and prosperity. The specific functions of the organ have been deliberately hidden and withheld from our knowledge. Interestingly, the official history states that the first organs of the world were water organs, in which the power source pushing the air is derived by water from a natural source or by a manual pump. No doubt a deceptive half-truth disguising the instrument's true interaction with water. And like I said before, most of these structures had areas nearby to store and hold large quantities of water. Many of the structures feature underground cavities or huge cisterns, some of which have been drained and some kept intact. Sometimes the cistern was located apart from and outside of the structure. The controllers have redesignated many of these areas as Roman baths. That's why Bath Cathedral in England is located right next to the Roman baths. The water was also stored in red brick power stations, capacitors, or water towers. Open rectangular sites, reservoirs, wells, and step wells. This is why step wells were constructed with precise geometric patterns. Again, the symmetrical structures here work to encourage oscillation or vibration of the ions. They kept the water electromagnetically charged, and the aqueducts and viaducts would have worked in a similar fashion. It is likely that a lot of the huge electromagnets we see scattered across our realm would have actually straddled passing water, much like we see on the Volga Don Canal, even though it's unlikely that the Volga Arch is original, and that many roads themselves were constructed during the Great Reset. It is likely that the inheritors of the 19th century were instructed to drain and fill many of the tributaries that once carried water. That's why we see drained castle moats and star stations. Perhaps that's what a lot of the surplus mud we see during this period was used for. Perhaps a lot of homes and buildings were constructed with underground chambers to store their own personal supply of living water, and these areas were destroyed, filled in, and forever hidden with vast amounts of mud during the 19th century. The use of electromagnetism, sound waves, and water would have had endless applications and uses in the old world, most of which we will never know about. But many structural remains do offer a lot of clues. 
the abundance of remarkable and impossible stately homes, halls, and manors found throughout our realm all point to the mass-scale farming practices of the old world. We travel miles to marvel at their beauty and grandeur, but more impressive than the structures themselves are their gardens and water gardens. We have the Palace of Versailles, Schwetzingen Palace, the Royal Palace of Caserta, Niffenberg Palace, Herrenhausen Palace. Even today, they still retain much of their splendor and brilliance. But it's when we look at some of the old plans of these areas that we realize just how otherworldly these sites were. They were never constructed to house the elite. They were the farms of old. Look at the gardens. They are cymatic gardens. Even from these old illustrated plans, we can see just how gargantuous these farms were. Microcosmic grid systems suggestive of the entire larger power grid itself. The cymatic gardens were likely grids cultivated with sound and the living water to grow food, herbs, and who knows what else. Even contemporary scientists openly acknowledge that sound waves strongly influence the growth of fruit, vegetables, and crops. And to this day, some of these structures retain a lot of their glory when viewed from above. The Palace of Versailles, a wondrous geometric marvel. A collection of impossible structures, extraordinary cymatic gardens, and water systems. Let's venture closer into the Palace of Versailles and have a look. Hold on now. Wait, what? This is not the Palace of Versailles. I really need to fix this thing. It's been acting up a lot lately. Where are we? Wait a minute. I recognize this place. Memories from a long time ago. This is Chatsworth House in the Peak District, England. Oh well, this should do. Come on, let's see what we can find. Chatsworth House was completed in 1708, we are told. Its story, much like the story of the entire Peak District, is a fabrication, a complete lie. The place has changed much over the years. It is situated beneath two large bodies of water, the Emperor and Swiss Lake. The water from the lakes is channeled across a broken aqueduct before falling 79 feet and meandering gently down the hills in complex waterways and running right into Chatsworth Estate. The waters feed the estate's own lakes, rivers and streams through a series of runways and a multitude of complex tunnels beneath the estate and the structure itself. Due to the estate's repurposing, much of this remains hidden, but you can see the tunnels quite clearly here, snaking their way down. It is one interconnected water system. Waterways deliver themselves into waterfalls at the impressive rockery before continuing on their journey. All of the water gathers into a central, rectangular front piece which feeds the Emperor Fountain. The water then continues underground until it pours into the River Derwent, a 66 mile long tributary of the River Trent, which runs throughout the Peak District. While much of the estate has undergone some serious restoration, which is actually a fancy, deceptive word for criminal gutting and destruction of technology, there are a lot of haunting remains of its former glory. It is important to note that unlike many of the huge energy generators, Chatsworth House was probably partially occupied. By farmers, that is. The central engine was located off-site and has been subsequently removed and repurposed as a larder to store hunted game. This magnificent, gorgeous structure would have functioned as a small generator, which also contained a small engine in its center. It was repurposed as the stables. The horses of the 19th century clearly lived better lives than most of the population. Above, 
Atop of the hill next to the Emperor and Swiss Lake, we can see the quadruple capacitor or water tower. This was repurposed as a hunting tower. But stalking the 105 acre grounds, a visitor with eyes to see might spot some unusual sights. One of which is the half ruined obelisk hidden away in the tangled overgrowth at the bottom of the hill below the lake. The official controlled history that visitors receive when touring Chatsworth conveniently leaves out any mention of the obelisk. For you see, the hunting tower was not Chatsworth's only capacitor. The entire estate needed constant water storage to fulfill its energetic requirements and purposes. There are many odd structures dotted around that remain unexplained. And then there is this, the Cascade, a true little wonder. The dome, a series of toroidal circles that rise to meet the smaller copper dome. They tread carefully here, making sure they force a distorted history on you. But, as always, they cannot help themselves. They just have to tell you, in their own roundabout controlled manner. As the placard states, water can be made to flow over the roof and out of 13 spouts. Some of these spouts are crafted in the form of immaculate stone dolphins and giant fish. There are even hidden jets in the floor, they tell us. The water is received from the lakes above and is used twice more in its journey to meet the River Derwent below. Once in the South Lawn Fountain and again the private West Garden. But look closer at what they acknowledge. Each step of the cascade is different from the one below and above it to vary the sound of the falling water. This was allegedly built in 1703. Why would an 18th century people be concerned with varying the sound of falling water? How did they even have the knowledge and skills to manipulate the sound of water like this? And it's everywhere in the estate. The waterways, streams and rivers all meander gently down to rest briefly at ponds and lakes before continuing their journey toward the River Derwent. Their journey is one of such splendid sounds. As you begin to traverse the labyrinthine passages of our corrupted history, you will inevitably meet the lithographs, renderings, engravings, illustrations and paintings. How easy it is to lie when there is no photographic or visual evidence just artistic interpretation. We would never accept illustrations as reliable sources of information today. So why do we accept them as historically accurate? And while these are not to be trusted, devoting some time to browsing their particulars can yield some interesting insights. For instance, the fountain here looks wildly out of proportion. Did it used to jet water more powerfully? and some would claim artistic exaggeration. But if you dig a little deeper, you come to learn that the original Emperor Fountain, constructed in 1843, was able to jet water at a height of 296 feet. What? How? This is the 19th century we're talking about. And like I said, they cannot help themselves. Even Wikipedia states that the water power of the fountain found a practical use in generating Chatsworth's electricity. There it is, barely hidden in plain sight. And as we continue browsing these little illustrations, we stumble across it. An old engraving of Chatsworth from above. Look at the size of this. Cymatic gardens, rows and rows of crops, large bodies of water that are no longer there. And again, many would claim artistic exaggeration, the unreliability and inaccuracy of illustrations, and rightly so. But when we look at Chatsworth from above on Google Earth, what is this we find? Shadows on the ground across from the river? 
No. These are the markings of old infrastructure that was torn down. The markings suggest there was once a bridge here. A bridge we see in the illustration. Look a little closer. An octagon with the clear outline of an old generator. So yes, the illustration is a lie. The estate was much, much larger than depicted here. In 2018, there was a heat wave in England and the old markings of Chatsworth's former glory started appearing in the grounds themselves. They had to acknowledge it. Sometimes mud and lies are not enough to bury the truth. Chatsworth was a huge farm in the old world. As I said before, the illustrations and paintings are not to be trusted. More often than not, they are used as tools of deception against us. But as you see here, they do have a tendency to backfire on the controllers. Just like with the plans of star stations and cities, our own technological access to tools such as Google Earth validate these old plans and illustrations as half-truths. You can bet good money that even the plans and illustrations are only giving us a fraction of the full picture. Just like here with the plan of Chatsworth. And it's in Chatsworth that we encounter the first of many acts of barbaric desecration by the hands of the enemy. Chatsworth's great conservatory stood immense until destroyed in 1920. It was 84 meters long and 20 meters high and constructed, they say, in 1840 before the establishment of automatic glass manufacturing. Huge, interconnected tunnels and water pipes collected under the ground of the structure to provide heating via boilers and hot water. An engineering feat as impossible as the construction of the structure itself. It was designed by Chatsworth's gardener, Joseph Paxton. Paxton is a phantom that haunts the pages of the history books. Paxton's story is one of fortunate circumstance, daring innovation and success. It is, unfortunately, a dishonest story, an unconvincing fiction. We are told that Paxton secured a gardening role when he was 20 years old, while working at Chiswick Gardens. And it was here that he encountered William Cavendish, the Duke of Devonshire, who was so impressed by young Paxton's horticultural abilities that he hired him as head gardener of Chatsworth House. Paxton is responsible for creating the following. Chatsworth's Arboretum, its Rockery, the Emperor Fountain, you remember, the fountain that sprayed water into the air at twice the height of Nelson's column. The Great Conservatory. He was responsible for cultivating the Cavendish banana, the most consumed banana in the world today, and designing railway stations all over the Peak District. What a talented and productive young man. Paxton's achievements, however, did not end with the banana and the conservatory. The farce doesn't end here. What a tangled web we weave when setting out to deceive. Paxton's success with Chatsworth led him to design the infamous Crystal Palace of London, just in time for the Great Exhibition of 1851. It was originally constructed in Hyde Park for the fair. It was constructed in just over a year, an engineering feat never again repeated. It was made from more than a thousand iron bars and its overall mass comprised of over 4,000 tons of iron. The Chance Brothers glassworks in Smethwick provided the 300,000 sheets of glass. Remember, this was before automatic glass manufacturing. This is the glassworks in which the glass was produced. A simple maths equation gives us an average of 822 glass panes produced every day, seven days a week, for a year. Right here, in this factory. This was Paxton's initial plan sketch for the structure. He went from this to this in a year. Furthermore, 
The entire Crystal Palace was able to house gigantic trees, and they had to board a lot of the glass panes up and cover a lot of the top of the structure during the World's Fair exhibition because the interior of the structure became too hot. Wouldn't Paxton, who designed the Chatsworth Conservatory, know that a huge glass palace would produce immense heat? The entire narrative soon dissolves into stupidity when we realize that a year later, in 1852, they dismantled the Crystal Palace and moved the entire structure to Sydenham in South East London, where it was rebuilt with two additional huge water towers at either end of the monstrous structure. Interestingly, no photographic evidence of the original Hyde Park Palace exists. Just illustrations. Wouldn't the structure have been the focus of many photographers during the opening of the Great Exhibition of 1851, the first of its kind? It is highly likely there were either two of these Crystal Palaces in London, and both destroyed, or the High Park Palace is just an outright lie. Interestingly, a few years after its relocation to Sydenham, this map of the palace was produced, all designed at the hand of our genius gardener. He struggled with the water supply, we are told. After all, supplying 12,000 fountains, two of which shot water 250 feet into the air, and the various cascades would be a difficult task to achieve. But clearly not for Paxton. He made it happen. Interestingly, the Crystal Palace also featured one of these impossible, grand and spectacular organs. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, while Mr. Paxton was redesigning the Crystal Palace at Sydenham, he was also designing the glorious Mentmore Towers for none other than Baron Mayer Rothschild. Who would have thought that a random, young, 20-something gardener would go on to be responsible for some of the most impossible and impressive engineering feats in history. Let's also not forget about his banana. Paxton is an example of the enemy's laziness when it comes to hiding our true history. It is not fathomable or even possible for the citizens of the 19th century to have even built these structures, let alone assign their inception to one sole man. The Crystal Palace and its gardens just like Chatsworth, were huge farming grids that used to live in water in conjunction with sound and electromagnetic energy to cultivate a whole range of wondrous produce. Kew Gardens in London is another example. The abundant electromagnetic energy was able to produce conditions of heat with ease and the vibrational frequencies encouraged growth. Perhaps that's why Crystal Palace housed a grand organ, utilizing frequencies and vibrations to enable the growth of produce. And that's why the controllers were able to assign the cultivation of the banana, an exotic fruit, to a fabricated Englishman. The technology already established in England was able to grow many things with ease. Among other impressive Horticultural achievements attributed to Paxton's genius were the perfect pineapples, another tropical fruit he grew at Chatsworth. He grew enormous lily pads, which could hold the weight of a human. He grew gigantic sequoia redwoods at Chatsworth, which usually only thrive in humid conditions. He grew them with ease, and many of these redwoods remain today, a spectacular sight to behold. It's probably worth noting that among Paxton's many other talents, Wikipedia also tells us that he became quite skilled in moving gigantic trees, as well as gigantic crystal palaces. The largest of these trees weigh in 7,000 kilograms. How? With horse and cart? Why are humans so gullible? They destroyed the beautiful and impossible Chatsworth Conservatory in 1920. As the Duke's son said in a letter to his father, they blew off well over 200 pounds of explosives to tear it down. So it must have been well built. 
The structures of the old world were built to stand for centuries. What a great shame. The lies surrounding the Peak District do not end with Paxton. The entire national park was one gigantic interconnected electromagnetic water system of the old world. It was most likely one of Britain's primary suppliers of farming goods. The National Park boasts one of the largest collections of stately homes, halls and manors, all of which would have functioned as huge farms. It was also a regional retreat that specialised in healing. Yes, that's right, healing. The Peak District is home to two large towns, Matlock and Buxton. Buxton is famous for its bottled water, and Matlock is renowned for its historical baths. Even today, both towns boast an enviable collection of old world structures. We see an abundance of old generators, domed pavilion structures, capacitors, colonnades, columns, bandstands, gardens and water systems. Overlooking the town of Matlock is River Castle. Its silhouetted frame and turrets stand regal in the distance. It is a derelict structure and has been derelict for over a century. The curious public are not allowed near the structure. They tell us it was built very quickly by a Mr. John Smedley. Smedley was, we are told, an industrialist. By the 1850s, he had become the driving force behind Matlock's hydropathic industry. Hydropathy is the practice of healing and curing diseases through the use of water. The official narrative states that Smedley built Smedley's Hydro, which sits on Smedley Street in Matlock. It is now a government council building. Smedley's Hydro was just one of the hydropathies in the region. At one point, we are told, there were over 20 hydropathic establishments in the region. Just look at these structures. Smedley did not build the hydro. Its structure and immense water tower evades his capabilities and the capabilities of all the 19th century citizens. The citizens of the 19th century Peak District inherited all of this infrastructure and the controllers of our realm knew that they needed to squash any possibility of it being used for its original intended purposes or for any of the inheritors to discover the truth. It was just too obvious, and soon someone amongst the crowd might start putting two and two together. So they did what they do best and employed a puppet. But unlike Paxton, who was able to achieve fame and fortune for taking all of the credit, Smedley had a different role to play, a role that many puppets in our society today still play. His mission was to carefully control the introduction of hydropathy, only for it to be declared primitive or fraudulent and then subsequently buried and eradicated as a serious practice. His story is a very similar story to another enemy puppet that has gained a lot more attention over the years. I too once fell for the lies surrounding this man's story. The hydropathies were able to accommodate hundreds of patients, and they were tremendously successful in curing a whole host of diseases and issues, ranging from inflammation and bilious attacks to paralysis, rheumatism and fevers. This was conducted through an array of different bathing techniques, applying dripping sheets as bandages, and fusing electricity, sound waves, and water. There were, as one newspaper reported, electric bells throughout the buildings. No doubt the actual potential of hydropathy was never fully expressed in Smedley's array of hydros, but they nonetheless helped people tremendously. And they were a huge success, so the controllers temporarily profited financially. The hydros healed and increased the well-being of people through water and its fusion with sound, vibration, frequency and electricity. Look at the electric treatment menu from one of the old brochures. Options for high-powered parabolic reflector, electric ionization, 
and high frequency treatment. Smedley also demonstrated the ability of etherized water to heat entire rooms in a profound way. The fernery at the hydro had a water heating system built into its walls and always maintained a constant temperature of 65 degrees, even when the room was filled with a crowd of 350 or so visitors. The temperature never deviated. How was this kind of technology available in the 19th century and yet today we do not have access to this kind of sophisticated heating? Historians and journalists of the time would deliberately smear Smedley, casting hydropathy as pseudoscience comparable with homeopathy. Smedley had many battles with the burgeoning medical industry and after his death the hydros were purchased and the structural alterations began. Like Tesla, Smedley played his role and successfully introduced the science of the old world to have it debunked, tarnished and sidelined forever. Hydropathy today is regarded as nothing more than a relaxing spa venture. All of its original applications of frequency and electricity have been eradicated from the practice. Smedley's role-playing allowed the controllers to justify the entire water grid system of the Peak District, successfully preventing the current 19th century and further subsequent generations from questioning its presence. The remains of the grid today are so evident. You can sit and relax to the soothing sound of water falling over the turreted regal Derwent Reservoir, which connects the entire region for its branching rivers and canals. You can stroll around shopping inside of old power stations and at old pumping stations. And in every area of the region, there are wonders waiting to be discovered. Not only in the larger towns do we find old fountains that once provided the living waters, but also in the remote villages. Tucked away, we find an old dry fountain. Look, the Lord's gift. A bittersweet joy to behold. The citizens of the old world unlock the power of electromagnetic water by studying the stars above in the firmament. The stars above taught them that the key to manipulating the ethereal energy they harnessed from the ionosphere was through water, sound waves, vibration and frequency. They honored this gift by constructing domes, by crafting star cities, cymatic magnetrons and praising the Lord and Holy Spirit for the living waters they received in return. They understood the firmament as both scientists and disciples. Viewer, I am hoping the picture is starting to become clearer in your mind and you will inevitably start to see things in a different light when pondering all of these impossible structures. It is not a coincidence that some structures like the Colosseum are also referred to as amphitheaters. Have you seen them from above? They look like speakers. Amphitheater is an interesting word. An amp is a unit of electric current and an amplifier is a device that increases signal, especially microwaves and audio. And no doubt you will start to put two and two together in terms of some of the inventions that we were allowed to play around with before they were discarded as antique in their efficiency. But time is of the essence. We could ponder examples of the old world's electromagnetic water grid system for hours, but I encourage you to get out and hunt down these structures yourself and to document them in your own time. We have to move on. We need to start... Wait, what? You want to know if these came from the old world? Yes, they did. And they are extremely important. The inevitable ticking of the clock. A deeply unsettling instrument, but unavoidable. I need to show you one more missing piece of the electromagnetic puzzle first, and then we will take a closer look at these timekeeping instruments. Come on, let's keep moving. <laughs> 